truth, justice. And the only place you hear the truth is right here with Big Sills. We tell you this all the time, okay? We tell you this all the time. We give it to you straight. This is the place where you will hear only the truth, justice, and the Big Sills way. And we start the program off with Big Sills. You know, it's funny. I have more people in here that give me a ton of shit and show up every day. And I got to tell you, I think it's more kind of like a foot fungus or something. Or maybe it's like crack to some of you. Because some of you actually can't stand me, but you're here every day. Those are the people I love talking to. Because you know why? That's what makes the show work. You show up every day. You show up every day. By the way, Xander Krause will be with us at 3.30. We will have Mark Holmes in his Dallas Cowboy talk. Folks, the Dallas Cowboys are a threat. Do I believe it yet? I'm not sure. Then at 5.30 Eastern, we will have Mike Gullick. He will join us and give us his spin on the first week of the National Football League season. Billy 500 couldn't make it. We gave him an open invitation. Maybe he didn't like what he saw in the first week of the Philadelphia Phillies, excuse me, the Philadelphia Eagles versus the Packers. We, we, we got a ton of stuff here, too. By the way, coordinator spoke. We're going to hit on that. But I first and foremost want to start the program off by doing this. 9-11. Um, it was an awful moment in this country's history, but it was one of the greatest times in our country. Because it showed us what American can be and what Americans can be. When we galvanized we rallied around one another after our and my Pearl Harbor. Obviously, I wasn't alive for Pearl Harbor, but this was our Pearl Harbor. The difference is it was on our soil. This was on our soil. This was on American soil, what happened. 3,000 people died at the Trade Center. The plane crash. Also, the Pentagon, I mean, you just never forget. For a brief moment in our country, nobody cared what politics you had. Nobody cared what denomination you were. You only cared about being an American. That was probably the most patriotic time in my life. Because nobody cared. It was about healing and then moving forward with vindication that we're better than you. You know why people hate Americans? Because we're better than you. We rise above. We have freedoms that no one has in the world. Whether you believe as a Republican, Democrat, Independent, it doesn't matter on days like that. Do you know when America's at its finest? Adversity. That's when we're at our finest. That's a true sign of character. You know, it's great to be a front runner, sure. But I want to know what you do when things are down. How are you acting? Pearl Harbor, United States galvanized its entire workforce to be fascism. We did. We, we, we're not going to allow 3,000 people to be killed in New York City to bring us down. No way. That's the greatest part of our country. In a, in a, in a, in a, in a crazy way, what happened on 9-11 makes you have hope of what our country can be. And what our country is deep down. All the stuff going on right now politically is superficial because deep down Americans are good. You know why? 
because of our freedoms. Okay. Prince goes, Hawaii isn't in America. 1945, it wasn't a state, dickhead. Try reading a map. Um, yeah. That was the best in the worst of times. By the way, don't be sad. Just remember how great we were and are and can be. Please hit the like button. All of us in it together. I'm not sad on a day like this. It used to make me sad. Now, you know what? I remember how great we were as Americans. So proud to be an American. Day like this, I get to talk sports. Shit. You think I could do this in China, Russia, anywhere else? No way. The shit that Big Sills and some of you talk in here? No way. Shit, they're arresting people in England right now for posting certain things. Okay? Just think about it. Guys, hit the like button. Thank you so much for what you guys have done for us the last couple weeks here. It's been insane great. Thank you. Can't wait to talk to Mike Gullick. Now we get to sports. As reported by Big Sills, Devin White blew a gasket last week because he was demoted. He got all the reps. And Vic Fangio confirmed it today. He was beat out. And all of a sudden, a tweaked ankle. I don't believe it. But the same ankle that after he found out they weren't negotiating his $100 million request in Tampa, that same ankle, I don't believe it. I think this guy's got a twisted brain, not a twisted ankle. That's what I think his problem is. This guy's a this guy's weak. He's unworthy to be a Philadelphia Eagle. He's unworthy to wear the uniform. He's unworthy to be an NFL player. Gotta cut the cancer out. Get a different guy. Sign a different dude. It's time. This has been a bad sign. But again. You know where Howie makes it up? Do you know where Howie makes it up? Zach Bond. Man, if Zach Bond puts another effort like he did versus Atlanta, this guy here, this could go down as one of the greatest signs. Okay? One of the greatest signs Howie Roseman has ever had. If Zach Bond puts another effort like that. I agree with John McMullen. I'm not expecting 15 tackles against the Atlanta Falcons come Monday night, but I'll tell you what, if he's around the rim with that, you got yourself a football player. I'll tell you this, listening to Vic talk about him too, that's a Vic Fangio sign. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. We'll get to all your thoughts. By the way, thank you so much for the Super Chats. We appreciate it. Um, you guys have been great with that, and you guys all go to the top when you throw a super chat at us here. So thank you very much. Want to get into a little bit. We're gonna talk about what Vic Fangio and what Kellen Moore said. Um, um, so again, personally, again, make make no mistake about it. Okay. Make no mistake about it. Um, hey, by the way, I could see all your, your uh, Xander just said this here, chatting is not working right now. That's why no comments. It's on YouTube's end. Actually, I'm seeing uh, comments that are coming up here. Guys, so if you post them, I can see them. Vic Fangio came out today and said, N'Kobe Dean is definitely the starter. Prince, I apologize. I thought you were attacking me here. Wayne, I see you too as well. So again, um, so again, guys, we appreciate you guys very much. So if you could just hang tight here with us a little bit. It's with YouTube here. 
And we'll get to all your comments here, and we'll get to your thoughts here in a minute once they rectify that. So please hit the like button, and we're going to get into um, a little bit here. We're going to talk about Vic and Kellen. We are also going to give you a little bit of the takeaways on what needs to happen against the Atlanta Falcons. So, guys, I appreciate it here. We apologize about the super chat. Um, Wayne, I see you're saying not working. Keep the show rolling. Nothing stopping big sales, says Kyle. Kyle, I can, if you guys post, I can read them. I mean, whatever. I, Xander, I see them posting stuff here. So hopefully you guys just keep rolling along with it here. Prince, put something up there for us, Prince. Let me see. You got a wrench, Prince. Put something up there in that box there, and I'll tell you if I can read it. And we can move forward. And you guys just keep posting, man, and I'll read them. So it may show up on your end that it's not sending, but I've got uh, – Dan, I hate Dallas as much as you, but um, Dak's quarterback rating after Hurts throwing two picks is crazy. I know they had Jalen Hurts on PFF as the lowest rated quarterback in the National Football League, I saw John McMullen post that as well. So we'll do the coordinators first. Then we'll get into what I think has to happen with the Atlanta Falcons. And then get this. There was a comment that was made about Jalen Hurts. And I want to tie it in with Kellen Moore here in a minute. Okay? I want to tie it in a little bit here with Kellen. So we'll do that here, but let's start it out with Vic Fangio. Oh, I want to show you guys something first. Um, I want to throw some Josh Allen stats at you here. You guys bring up the turnovers all the time, the interceptions. And since 2020, Josh Allen has 57, 57 turnovers. Since 2020. In that process, Josh Allen has 177 touchdowns. 45, 42, 42. Last year, four. It's a start to 2024 season. Four. He's got 57 turnovers and 177 touchdowns. Do you know what his record is since 2020? 48 and 18. He's 48 and 18 with 177 touchdowns. With nobody on the team. He doesn't have the same talent level that Hurts has in Philadelphia. He does not. Look at, look at Flexen. How he's. Howie hating on the chat. He's throwing it at Howie here. I got you, Flex. Hey, Flex, I hear you, man. So you think Howie. Okay. Who cares about PFF says busy? Hey, Prince, I read your stuff. You just, Prince just posted not working. Well, for me, I could read what you're saying, Prince. I could totally read what you're saying. Look at Flexing. Can't silence us. No one gives a shit about Allen. What a quarterback. Sensational. Sensational. Since, so, look at that. 177 touchdowns. 48 and 18. Okay? Unbelievable. Devin White season. What happened? What happened? Cody, how you doing? We are getting an error message, Sills. Hey, hey, Prince, still getting your uh, your post, though, brother. Okay? Prince says it's back. Way to go, Prince. Prince says it's back. We're ready to rock and roll. Here's Nick. Thanks for the super chat, brother. We'll steamroll Atlanta. Not so fast, my friend. If we play clean and smart football, we have much more talent than them. Cousins looked awful. 
and it's on prime time. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, sir. 48 and 18. Actually, he's 49 and 19 since 2020. What a quarterback. What an amazing quarterback Josh Allen is. All right. Let's get to Vic Fangio. Then we'll get to the Atlanta Falcons. What a quarterback. Good night. Unbelievable. Let's see here. Um, Sills, in Slay's video today release, he said that Vic's been practicing the red zone defense every day, having it on Fridays like prior DCs did. That's good stuff. And by the way, that was one of the best things that they did was red zone defense. So let's get into it here. This is Vic Fangio talking. Actually, I'm going to do Vic second. I'm going to do Kellen Moore first. We're going to do Kellen. And I want, I, want, I want to talk more with Kellen Moore here about the offense. And then I'm going to play a soundbite here from a, a television show that I saw a comment on. And I'm going to show you something here of why Jalen Hurts has struggled mightily and will struggle mightily. But I'll show you something, the impact that Kellen Moore has had on the football team. Okay? Here we go. Kellen Moore goes like this. First game, he goes like this. There's no questions. Um, he could have been a little bit better in some situations when it came to the play calling. Poor footing and the field conditions he thought played a factor as well. Um, he thought Jalen did a really nice job in handling the blitz. Um, no, get this. Dead's the Jew. I think you're back to predictability and I'm going to show you why. Okay. I think you're back to predictability. And this thing will be, unless Kellen Moore evolves the offense, it'll be predictable again. Okay? All right. Um, he thought Makaya Becton and Cam Jurgens did a really nice job. And Makaya played excellent football, kept everyone in front of him. I thought Makaya played well, too. And by the way, if you watch the 22, it looks like he played really good. He said Barkley is a premier player. Make no mistake about that. Saquon Barkley is a premier player, and it's going to just be game to game on how they use him in situations, whether in the passing game or whether it's going to be in the run game. It's going to be a game day situation. All right. I want you to hear something now on the predictability of Jalen Hurts. Because if you do watch the All-22, you see this, and once again, just after game one, this is exactly the stuff that you don't want Hurts to get comfortable doing. Now, I'm going to make a point to you. There was a show that was on ESPN this morning, and someone did a breakdown because they obviously have access to the 22 as well. And 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 this is this is this is what they had on that show, Get Up. And I want you to hear and what Kellen Moore says that what motion is doing and how it helped Jalen Hurts out. But I want you to listen to the breakdown because if you watch the breakdown, this is exactly what coordinators are seeing now and why I think by week four, Hurts once again in that offense will be predictable unless Kellen Moore fixes it. Here we go. With his precision. He was 0 for 5 on tight window throws, which means the target had fewer than a yard of separation from the defender. One of those was those three turnovers are tied for the most in a game in his career. So we gave Hawk a little assignment. We said, Hawk, I wanted to study the tape yep. of Jalen Hurts in week one and show me exactly what you see. And I think yeah. you found a very interesting line of delineation. Hey, uh, the, the way that Kellen Moore deployed pre-snap motion helped Jalen Hurts significantly. So here's the touchdown to Saquon Barkley. What you're going to see, they do a little shift. They're going to send the receiver in an orbit motion 
on a play action wheel concept with two posts to the to the front side. Mm-hmm. Now what this does is it shifts the, the Packers linebackers over and gives Sa- Saquon Barkley this edge. Obviously, great throw, but incredible play made by Saquon Barkley that not right. very many running backs can do. Here's the interception where it's just straight static lineup and running. And Jalen Hurts has problems seeing the field and making those decisions. He made some bad decisions when there was no pre-snap motion because the pre-snap motion allows him to stretch the defenses horizontally. And it was his precision. So what motion did was it did help Hurts because it moved people around and there were less traffic for him to have to decipher on reads. Well, what a coordinator is going to see is every time you have motion, you're going to know that Jalen Hurts, that motion is trying to dictate moving people around. Pretty soon you're going to become um, uh, predictable, and you're going to know every time they run that motion or the majority of the time they run that motion. And when you start figuring out what false motion is and false reads in the motion, once you start figuring that out, you still know he can't read a defense. That's exactly what you see. When he didn't have motion, he was terrible. He was 0 for 5 in it. But when he had it, it moved people around. So as a coordinator now, for me, again, once again, look at this guy here. Says that we're making this up. Did you not just hear what the guy said? When you do is just watch it. That's not making it up. He was 0 for 5. What do you, how is that making it up? Get, holy shit. Look at this guy. Hey, I'm sorry you don't want to hear this about your boy, but it's a fact. Okay? This is a fact, dude. Precision. He was for five on tight window throws, which means his target had fewer than a yard of separation from the defender. One of those was those three. Listen, Spike. Tied the most in a game in his career. So we gave Hawk a little assignment. Mm-hmm. We said, Hawk, I want you to study the tape yep. of Jalen Hurts in week one and show me exactly what you see. And I think yeah. you found a very interesting line of delineation. It, uh, the, the way that Kellen Moore deployed pre-snap motion helped Jalen Hurts significantly. So here's the touchdown to Saquon Barkley. What you're going to see, they do a little shift. They're going to send the receiver in an orbit motion on a play action wheel concept with two posts to the to the front side. Mm-hmm. Now, what this does is it shifts the, the Packers linebackers over and gives Sa- Saquon Barkley this edge. Obviously, great throw, but incredible play made by Saquon Barkley that not right. very many running backs can do. Here's the interception where it's just straight static lineup and running. And Jalen Hurts has problems seeing the field and making those decisions. He made some bad decisions when there was no pre-snap motion because the pre-snap motion allows him to stretch the defenses horizontally. And it was his precision. At the end of the day, Jalen Hurts cannot read a defense still. It's going to take time. Those are facts. Kellen Moore has been an impact on him. But what that happens is after a while, Hurts has got to be better. If it's just drop back and throw it, he's not very good. And like what Xander was trying to tell me about throwing across the middle, if you don't have motion, and when he did throw across the middle, he had two turnovers. This guy's still struggling from a year ago. And believe me, you know who made that touchdown pass happen with Barkley? It was Devontae in motion and A.J. the other way. That's what opened that play up. It was a really good design play by Moore. That's what people are looking at today. Okay? That is exactly. By the way, I see somebody said something in here. There is no doubt one of the things that was improved at least in week one was the fact that he did better in a small sample size versus the blitz. That's stage one. Remember I told you last week, this was going to be bumpy for him at the start. I said it in the post-game show. Hertz was the worst player in the huddle. But Hertz has more responsibilities than anyone in the huddle. But it was going to take time. That's all we were saying. Okay? So again, 
Every time you're sending people in motion now, Hertz is not going to be effective if he has to sit back and just drop back and throw across the middle of the field or what have you. He's still 2023. I'm not the only one saying this now. Everyone watching this, and if all of us are seeing it and saying it, coordinators already know this. Now, the big factor is going to be Kellen Moore. Here's what Kellen said, too. He goes, we have to evolve the offense on a weekly basis to not be predictable. And he used the, he used the words trend. Okay? He used the words trend. Hertz hasn't looked the same since last year versus San Francisco. Probably so. I appreciate the super chat. You're right. Okay? I mean, hey, uh, Hertz was the worst guy in the huddle. That's why he was the lowest rated quarterback in the league. No, make no mistake about it. When you go back and you watch, okay, get this. So wait a minute. Look at what Prince is saying. It's not predictable. Yet when he goes in motion, now you know they're trying to move people around so that it's not Hurts reading the defense. It's the receivers moving the backers and the safeties. You're going to figure that out every time you send them in motion. You're going to figure that out. It's going to be up to Kellen to disguise that. Okay? By the way, when they didn't have motion, he was terrible. Last year, too, as bad as the offense was, he still scored 26 points a game, too. So don't – he hasn't changed. The only thing that has changed has been the offense. Hurts is the same. Hurts is the same with one caveat. He did a nice job in game one versus Blitz. Still turned the ball over three times. Okay? I mean, the star of that football game was not the quarterback. The star of the football game was the running back. And the fact that, the, and, and once again, get this. Here are, the, here are the three stars in that football game. The two receivers in the back, not the quarterback. The quarterback was not a star in that game. Now, do you know when he became a star? When he ran the ball. 13 times. He's on pace with 230 carries. He can't sustain that, nor would I want him to. He's got to get better at reading defenses still. He is just not good at it. Okay? So, Sills, would you, would you downgrade for a C? No, no, no. I think I said C minus, actually, when it came to the entire team. Him, personally, I think he had a C game. I gave him a high grade of a C because he did a nice job in the blitz. That's where he improved. He did not improve in reading the middle of the field. He had two turnovers across the middle. He did not improve at reading defenses. And Kellen Moore, his scheme did a great job. And his pass routes, I – when you watch the film more and more, you see some of the deficiencies still in the passing game. Listen, I'm going to say it one more time to you. You cannot have so many mistakes, missed throws, late throws with talent like that in your huddle. That is unacceptable. You have too much talent. You know who gets a bye? Allen gets a bye because there's no one in his huddle. You have too many superstars in your huddle to have a quarterback making bad decisions and late throws. You can't have that. And remember what we're talking about here. We're talking about winning a Super Bowl, not 11 games. We're talking about getting to an NFC title game, not getting to the playoffs. There is a difference in the conversation in Philly than there is, say, in Arizona or Chicago or anywhere else. You know what that is? You're looking to try to get to the Super Bowl this year. That's what you're looking to do. You want to call yourself a Super Bowl contender? Well, you've got to play like one at the quarterback position. 
Hit the like button. We appreciate it. Okay. Um, here we go. You know, Sills, I see you as some sort of football therapist because ever since I turned tuned into your show a few uh, years back, I've been less stressed about my kids because some of the things you always point out. Thank you very much, Tony. I appreciate that. By the way, can this stuff be fixed? Yes. With time and reps. More reps. More game reps. Can he get better? He will get better. The more you do something, I don't really care what it is. You're going to get better at it. Now, the problem that you have with Hurts is too many high percentage throws. Okay? Too many high percentage throws, especially across the middle of the field. He struggles in the middle of the field still, in my opinion. Nice job again when it came to the blitz stuff. The most alarming part of this situation is that Jalen Hurts will only regress in scrambling with the ball with each season. He needs to evolve now. Hey, and, 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 and Gooby, one of the things you have to have evolving now is this. You've got to evolve with that kind of talent you have in the huddle. Nobody on the planet. I'll tell you what, Brock Purdy doesn't struggle with his talent. He's not late on throws. He challenges the middle of the field. Okay? And he doesn't need a ton of motion. That's because Kyle Shanahan attacks the middle of the field. Think about what they do. They have to move people around pre-snap for Hurts to be successful in the passing game, or he's not. That's not a pro quarterback. That's, that's not a pro quarterback. The quarterback is supposed to move the guys. Okay? The quarterback is. Not the coaches. Okay? So, I mean, again, and we're not talking about a high-powered defense on that side of the football here. He's got to get better at progression reading. Let's continue. Um, he was really impressed, Kellen Moore. Johnny Mitchell, if you go back and watch him, Xander picked this kid out in the exhibition season and thought that there'd be a um, role for him on the team. You know what the role is? In the run game. This guy blows people up in the run game. I mean, he does a nice job when it comes to blocking in the run game. I mean, excellent. Watch him blow guys up. He did an excellent job. When they put him out there, I think he had like 15 plays. He did a spectacular job. Okay. And you watch him, you point him out, and you single him out. He looks pretty damn good. The concerning part is Hertz should be further along. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Dual threat. How can you be further along when you're constantly interacting and changing out coordinators all the time? How can he be further along? Uh, how could he actually be further along when you're constantly changing different uh, coordinators and you're having different philosophies, different terminologies? I told you, Jalen Hurts' uh, development is going to be a rocky development in Philadelphia until they get stable at the, at the coordinator position. Sales. Jalen Hurts transitioned from 23 to 24. Looks like a kid who went from driving an automatic transmission to driving a manual transmission. Steering the car is the same, but he's learning the pedals. Absolutely. That's exactly what went on in that game against the Packers. You could see he was in training wheels still, Bob. Okay? He struggled again without the motion and seeing the field. Get this. The motion clouded and covered up his inability to read defenses. That's all motion has done. When you dissect it and you break it down like that, other coordinators and Raheem Morris is breaking that down. That's what they're going to do. They're gonna, they know this going into Monday night now. That he was 0 for 5 in premium throws without motion, and with motion, he was great. They were moving guys around. And I'll tell you something one more time. 
Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown are making Hurts a better player, not vice versa. Okay? That's a team winning in spite of your quarterback. Those guys made that Saquon Barkley play happen. Why? They were decoys into play because they moved backers one way and the other, and they were sliding, and Barkley it made a great play down the sideline. You know, the guy's wrong. I thought Hurts threw a great pass down the sideline as well because he put in a play. He, he didn't want to give Jalen too much. I, I think that was a nice throw. So I disagree a little bit with that take because I thought it was a nice throw. Um, okay? So once again, if you really look at it, he's still Jalen Hurts 2023 with the caveat of they made an emphasis on, without question, two things in that game against the Packers. And two things you come out. And by the way, I saw somebody in here say something. Seals is picking things up. Those are the things that stop you from winning Super Bowls. Those are the things that you have to be to be a great quarterback. Don't you want to be a great quarterback? Or do you want to just be a guy who puts up numbers like Kirk Cousins and then goes home and collects your money? We're talking about winning a Super Bowl again. We're not talking about a scenario. I'm not trying to get them better. Dude, some of you take this criticism as something that it's a shot. This is where he has to fucking get better. Don't you want your guy to get better? Get this. Look at this here. An anti-Jalen show? It's pointing out where he has to improve for you to win that Super Bowl. Boy, Spike, you without a doubt are a pussy. There is no doubt about it, man. You are really soft as shit. There is no doubt about it. You could never be coached by a coach in any sport whatsoever. Because I'm pointing out something here to get the kid better. You're taking it as a shot at the kid. It's not a shot. I don't give a shit about Jalen Hurts as a human being. I could care less. I could totally care less. Okay, I'm talking about getting the kid better. Don't you want him to get better? Dude, there is not a dude on the planet, on the planet, on the planet right now who doesn't want to get better in the NFL and point out the deficiencies in the team? Jalen's problem is decision-making. He was way off when it came to decision-making on Friday night. Um, it was horrible as for motion. 49ers run at every play. You know what, Prince? Great take. and Thank you for the super chat. Hey, Prince, the difference is, is that Brock Purdy's not late on his throws, and he makes great decisions. It's one thing to have, and I agree with you, Prince. I personally, without a doubt, agree that the motion helps out Brock Purdy a ton. Okay? No question about it. No doubt about it. Prince, I'm talking about, hey, if Jalen Hurts cleans that shit up, he'll put you in the Super Bowl. And you know what, what's great about talking to you here on this, Prince? Bottom line is, you and I know that that's right. We're not talking about the kid not being able, not working at it, not working hard at it. He's going to. But this is going to take time. You Get this. You guys are like, and still scored 34 points. That's the entire point of this. That's the entire point of this conversation. He played like that in circumstances and was reckless with the ball. And you still won. And you still put 34 up. That's why it's a C-minus effort from a team that has so much more room. Look, I'm not going to sit here and make you feel good about yourself. I'm not talking about you, Prince. I, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and make you feel better about yourself. I'm just going to tell you the way it is. That's right. RC3. RC3 is coming around. RC3, you're right. They clean that shit up. That offense can be scary. It can be scary. Right now, it's not. 
Okay. Hey, it can be scary. This is where I'm at. That's what I'm talking about. Guys, please hit the like button. Seals, I think Hertz saw the coverage. I don't think he trusts what he sees yet. You know, hey, Bob, you know why he doesn't trust what he sees yet? Reps. Reps. The more he does it, the more he'll get confident. The more he does it, the more he'll feel better at it. Okay? You're late on your throws when you're not believing in what you're seeing. Trust comes with film work and after the fact in repetitions. Thank you, Spike. I appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Guys, that's what we're talking about here. Okay? No, 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 no. Listen. See, Roland? Here's the deal, Roland, on, on the turnovers, and I've now come to the understanding of where Hertz is in his progress of um, developing into a progressing reading quarterback. You know why? Because the turnovers are going to be high as he makes his transition. The numbers should come down. The turnovers should come down. Okay? The turnovers should come down the more reps he gets. That's what Moore's even saying. Hertz is the worst player in the huddle. This team ain't going anywhere. If he doesn't step up, he has the um, Avengers on this team. No excuses for him. Crowley, here's the deal, though. He's got the most responsibility in the huddle. He's got a ton to do. Now they've added protections. There's a ton of stuff he's doing new this year. You know what's funny? I have been saying this the entire offseason, and now everyone's coming to the realization of what I'm saying is true. Do I think Jalen Hurts will get better by week eight? Yes. Okay? I do. Do I think that, say Atlanta, that's why this. Every weekend is going to be a tough game. You're not blowing anybody out. You're, you're not blowing anyone out. I mean, I thought Green Bay stunk. You should have beat that team with a decent defense 34 to nothing or 34 7. All the penalties, Green Bay had 10 penalties, but you couldn't stop the run. Green Bay was in the game because of the run game, not the passing game. Think about that. One of the so-called best passers in the game of Jordan Love, he didn't keep him in the game. Josh Jacobs kept him in the game. I mean, they, they ran the ball. They ran the ball down your throat, Green Bay. Here, so... Um, he has to trust the process. Hate to use that BS, but, you know, you're right. But, but again, Adam, he has to do this. Just keep getting reps. Just keep getting reps. Oh, absolutely. Samuel is dead on. I think you're going to win the Super Bowl in 25, not this year. That's where I think you're going to win the Super Bowl. I think your best chances to win a Super Bowl are next year. But obviously, you're not going to surrender the fact that it's going to take some time to get this defense up to snuff and up to par. And we're going to talk about Vic Fangio here in a minute, but I want to get through Kellen. Johnny Wilson, go back and watch him. 10, 15 plays he had. He was really good, man. Um, trends. This is what Kellen brought up. He said, this is the one thing that we have to concern ourselves with here. And the offense has to continue to evolve. And we have to keep an eye on trends. Trends is motion. He, get this, Kellen Moore, week in and week out, has to make sure that it doesn't look the same to help Hertz. Because Hertz is still young in the evolution of reading defenses. Okay? Folks. 
I know some of you are taking this like this is a rip on him. How in the world could you think that Jalen Hurts has been educated right as a progressive quarterback or a progression quarterback in the NFL when all of you bring up the most important thing with all the different terminologies and systems? By the way, that Shane Sykin system that he ran at 22, as I told you, this is a brand new football offensive playbook. There is nothing that resembles 2022 to what we're seeing right now. Nothing. There's nothing remote. They run that 22 offense in Indianapolis, not in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania anymore. There's some, there's some, there's some leftover plays from that 22 team. But that playbook is gone. This is a completely different. Dude, Shane Steichen wasn't using Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown as decoys in the passing game. They were throwing to one guy, him, him, and no one else. And so get this. Like Diego just said, when Hurts in the offseason said this is a 95% new offense, he was speaking the truth. He was telling the truth. Organization for some reason. And by the way, why do you think the organization, Xander, think about this. Why do you think the organization had a cow with Hertz saying that the offense was brand new? You know why? Because it's an indictment on Nick Sirianni that the offense didn't evolve. Let me show you another part of evolving offenses. I didn't know that in Baltimore, Lamar Jackson, when he won the MVP in 17, and he led the NFL in passing touchdowns, I didn't know that that offense wasn't good enough for him. But you know what happened? It didn't evolve. What'd they do? They fired a coordinator in Baltimore that helped that guy lead the NFL in passing touchdowns with 3,100 passing yards. I'll say it again, 31 or 3,200 passing yards in 17. 3,200 yards. He led the NFL in touchdown passes and won the most valuable player award, the first one. They fired him. Why? It became predictable. They fired Greg Roman. The, the offense, people were starting to get accustomed to what they were doing. Can you imagine that? You helped the guy win the MVP, lead the NFL in touchdown passes, and you fired him. Why? Became too predictable. That's what's happened with Hurts. They moved off the 22 offense because it was too predictable and dangerous. The only thing that resembled the 22 offense in that game past Friday was what? The 13 carries. The 13 carries is the only thing that resembled the 2022 offense. They're trying to evolve off that. That's what Kellen Moore said today. Okay? This is all about development. You know what would be the absolute crime? All this work you're doing. And if Kellen's not here next year, back to square one. Because this is good. You're actually, for the first time, teaching this guy to be a modern-day NFL passer. And you know what? Does he have the physical school skills to do it? Yes. But this is going to be – hey, let me guys ask you this. I'll, I'll give you another example. Was he – did Andy Reid make Michael Vick a better passer than any time in his early career when he was in Atlanta? Dude, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. He made him a better passer. Why? Because he was teaching him progression trees. And Vic, like you said, and KC, Vic even said it. But Vic was in his, like, what, ninth year? That's called evolution. That's called up in your game. 
Michael Vick, I remember him saying, and I'm going to kind of uh, paraphrase it. He's like, I wish I had Andy early in my career. I wish I had him earlier in my career. I'd be a, further along in my development. It's the same thing with Hurts. Seals, the real trend, tendency. Hey, Bob, you sound like a coach. Is Jalen Hurts ball, uh, bailing out to his right instead of climbing the pocket? You mean, you mean a, a Bob, I'm assuming stepping up in the pocket. These are designed to move quarterbacks off their spot. Jalen Hurts' is default is to the right. Eliminate 75% of the field. Correct. And what happens too, Bob, when you move right? You put, a, you put another defender on the field called the sideline. So you're not playing just against 11 guys. You're playing against 12 guys when you go to the side of the field. So you got a 12th dude you're dealing with now because you make the sideline closer and you make limited space. Okay? Guys, this is not a rip session. That's right, Jason. You shrink the field. Jalen is learning, but he made it harder on himself by rolling right. That's what Bob's saying. When he rolls right like that, that's a comfort zone. He makes it harder on himself. Stay in the pocket. Step up. Cam did a nice job, and so did Micaiah. There weren't a lot of people in his face up the middle. And I don't believe he's a coward. I just think he needs to step up in the pocket. But what happens when you step up in the pocket? You've got limited passing lanes. You know, you know, when you step out and you roll around, this is the one thing also that really hurt Aaron Rodgers against the 49ers on Monday. When Rodgers had issues when it came to finding pass receivers and have clear pass routes, he was able to get out in the peri uh, perimeter and create those passing lanes. Well, he can't do that because he doesn't have the wheels anymore. Okay? He, he doesn't have the wheels. Can he win just by being a pocket passer? I don't know. Now, is it week one in rust? Maybe. Maybe. Okay? Maybe. Sills, not only does Hurts run right, Purdy did two against the Jets and missed by a mile. Anytime you move a quarterback off his spot, Brock Purdy is not a very mobile guy. He looks it, but he's not. And I mean by mobile guy on the throw. He is a point guy. Kurt Warner. Tony Dungy told me numerous times, and, and, and so did Monty Kiffin. You know how you get to great quarterbacks? Move them off their spot. Move them off their spot. That's, again, the issue that you get when we're talking about how you get to a good quarterback. By the way, I know some of you think you're going to blow Atlanta out. You're not going to blow Atlanta out with no rush and no pressure. You're, ju you're just not. That game will be closer, and Atlanta will be better. But you know why? Because you have no pressure. We're going to get to Atlanta here in a minute. But, again, Kellen Moore is talking about trends. And he said that the Falcons have some pretty good ball players. Judon was a factor. Um, their two safeties are good football players. Okay. I mean, they are. They're exceptional. Um, they're exceptional. Let's go to Vic Fangio now. Guys, please hit the like button. Jason says this. Jason, that's field and had a lot to do. It did. It did. I'm not going to lie. And you know, you know why? Vic Fangio doesn't really make excuses, and he brought it up too. I do think it had a lot to do with the footing and getting uh to the to the passer here. I I do. I I will give that to you. But let me get to Vic Fangio now. Then we'll do the Atlanta Falcons. Here we go. Said his run defense was poor. It was 163 on the ground. Second half, 10 yards of carry. Playing against a pretty good back and a good offensive line. Matthews and um, Lindstrom are pretty good players in the middle there. The tackle in the, uh, the tackle in the center are pretty good ball players. It's a pretty good old line. Top five. And against that defensive front, who underachieved against the Packers, 
That will be a challenge. He said Quinion Mitchell played very well. And when you watch him on the 22, he's right. I heard the guys talking. There's a decision to be made. I'm going to say it one more time to you. You cannot put Avante Maddox in the slot. And with the injury to Isaiah Rogers, you're limited now in having to play Mitchell over on the corner. But you could tell just by the press conference, Vic would rather prefer to have Quinion Mitchell in the slot in the middle of the field with his athleticism so that he could cover more of the field. Remember something with a corner. Look at how ineffective, but yet effective, Slay was. Made no plays. They didn't challenge him. You want Quinion Mitchell on the field making plays. He's your most athletic secondary player. So you're limited back there in decision-making on what you're going to do. Okay, if Isaiah Rodgers comes back, I think Vic is going to put Isaiah out there on the corner and put him in the slot. I'm talking Quinion Mitchell. You know why? He thinks Quinion Mitchell, in my opinion, can make more of an impact play um, out of that position than on the corner position. Because at the end, remember what this is going to be about. This is going to be about covering Pitts and Bijan. Well, Pitts and Bijan are not going to be on the numbers. They're going to be in the middle of the field. There's going to be screen plays. There's going to be scene plays, and they're going to throw to the hash. Quinion Mitchell on the corner doesn't help me. They got London, who's a good player, but he's the lesser of those other two dudes. Okay? He's the lesser. Mitchell, to me, will make more sense making plays in the middle of the field because he's your more athletic guy. Avante Maddox, I don't know what is wrong with him, but maybe at week one, but he's he stunk. And Gardner Johnson, holy shit. I'm assuming that was week one on him as well. But between Avante Maddox and Gardner Johnson, they both were terrible. Hit the like button here. Um, I'll tell you what, I learned, I learned something about Vic Fangio. Vic Fangio said that he saw him in New Orleans, Zach Bond. And with the limited amount of plays and limited amount of football that he had at position when he was in New Orleans, he said on tape, I thought he could do it. I didn't know he could do it. But having watched him in camp and after watching him in the first game, I know he can do it. And he can play in the middle. And that is clearly a recommendation that Vic wanted this guy on the team and how he went and got him. That's working together as an organization. That's really good teamwork by Roseman and Vic. That showed me a little bit there also that how he is working with Vic. It's good. I did, I thought he was just, hey, this is my decision. and That's, that's not true there. Fangio said, I thought he could do it. I wasn't sure he could, but now I know he can. And there was clearly a recommendation of Howie to go get him. Seals, is there a dominant defense in the NFL right now? I think the Niners, because I don't see it. Jets, Ravens, Detroit, Browns, all were said to be dominant. That's week one, too. I'm not going to freak out over it, but I thought the 49ers looked exceptional. Um. He said the more versatility we have, and this is what he's talking about with Quinion, being able to play multiple positions. Cooper DeGene playing multiple positions. Um, he says the more you have, the more you're going to be able to disguise your defenses when you have that kind of disguise coverages. Oh, 49ers too. I thought the Patriot defense did exceptionally well, especially against the Burrow-led Bengals. If I were had to put them in like that, I'd probably that, – yes – Patriots, Steelers, 49ers, probably had the best weekend of all the defenses, I would say. Um, they've got to practice Cooper DeGene more. Got to get him up to speed. Man, I'll tell you what. If I'm Cooper DeGene, I put my hand up to Vic Fangio and say this. Let's do some work after practice. Let's get up to speed here. The quicker you get up to speed, the another body you'll have to be able to drop in the slot. Cooper DeGene's not going to play on the numbers, having missed so much of training camp, but I'll put him in the slot. Okay. I'll put him, I'll put him in the slot. I'll put him in the slot. 
And and then that frees me up to put Quenya back on a number. And that makes me look pretty good. My only problem is you're limited in experience with that. Okay, you are. You're limited with experience. Thank you, Samuel. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. He did a nice job, though, with this Zach Bond working with how, with um, Vic Fangio. He really did. He did a nice job. And I'm talking Howie Roseman. Did a nice job. Got to give him his props. Um, here's something here, man. It was confirmed by Vic. N'Kobe Dean had beaten Devin White out. Devin White's a liability on your team. He was asked if he's part of it. The only reason he said he's part of it is because he's on the roster and they haven't decided on what to do with him yet. Okay? They haven't decided what to do, whether to cut him or not. And they probably don't have another body because they're so limited and so low in talent and linebacker. And they don't believe that Trotter's right. The only reason, do you guys not agree? Xander, right? The only reason that Devin White is on the team is that Trotter Jr. is not ready. That's the only reason he's on the team. Is 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 because Trotter Jr. is not ready. He's he's just not ready. And they don't feel comfortable throwing him out there. But to me, what I would start doing is I'd start getting him some game reps. I'm talking Trotter Jr. Okay. I I I thought get him more reps out there. Okay. <clears throat> Put him out there. This has to be the most troubling thing that Vic Fangio said. When asked about Bryce Huff, he hasn't separated himself from the other guys. What? What? You gave a guy $51 million that's not better than anything you have on your team right now? Really? I mean, you gave a guy $51 million, and the defensive coordinator today said that Bryce Huff hasn't separated himself from the other guys. Nolan Smith and a 47-year-old Brandon Graham? You haven't separated yourself. What an absolute horrific start to the 2024 season for Bryce Huff. Your coordinator talks shit on you, and you play like shit. I mean, I'm not going to be kind here to this. Well, you know, you give him another. Give him a, he hasn't done dick. For three months. Three months. I'll tell you what Reddick has absolutely done. He has made the decision by the Eagles look bad, and he's making the Jets' decision by not giving me a new contract look bad. He's now 2-0, and playing only one week. He's 2-0. He made the Eagles look bad. That player made the he it may cost hey financially, no doubt. That is a horrible scenario on his point, but that dude made two teams look bad on one week. The Eagles by signing Huff and The Jets by not giving him a contract. I have never seen one player personally screw himself financially and absolutely make two organizations in one week look bad. Oh, absolutely. B hey, big picking. He's not off the hook to and looking shitty. Losing economic money like that, you'll never get back. You might as well light it up, throw it in a trash can, and light it on fire. Okay, I mean, yeah, Abe, here's the deal, Abe. 
This whole thing could have been resolved if he gave Reddick five more million bucks. Think about that. I mean, that guy made two teams look bad. That's pretty hard to do. He made a comment about Brandon Graham. I told Brandon Graham he's a good player. This is no ceremonial um, retirement tour. He's going to play. Good for him. Hey, by the way, nobody thought that Brandon Graham was going to be a bad player this year. But Brandon Graham will be a bad football player in December if this guy's playing 50 reps at 36 years old. Man, I mean, he goes, he's, and somebody asks, is he on a pitch count? Like, they can't have him on a pitch count. They need his play right now because Nolan Smith and, um, what's his name? Huff are not good right now. So good for the good. I mean, hey, Brandon Graham goes, he's a good player. Or, um, Vic goes, Brandon Graham's a good ball player. He's a very good ball player and he's going to play. How good is that to hear if you're Brandon Graham that the team needs you now because two guys that you drafted, one in the first round, or not drafted, but one guy you drafted in the first round and the other guy you gave $51 million. Think about that whole scenario there. You got a 36. How old is Brandon Graham? Is he 36? Boy, I'll tell you what. I was kind of against the sign to bring him back one more year. Xander was for it. I really wasn't. Man, thank God they did it. I'm wrong on this because think about it. Brandy Graham is covering right now, early part of the season for the 30th pick in the draft and a $51 million mistake. I mean, Brandy Graham getting more snaps than them dudes or as many snaps as those guys is an indictment on Nolan Smith. And Bryce Huff. This guy was brought back for depth, not to be in a rotation. That he said. I mean, the more the more Brandon Graham plays, the worse that contract looks. That Howie and the organization gave Bryce Huff. That guy was supposed to be a transition player from Huff, or Huff was supposed to be a transition player from Reddick, and. Moving off of Brandon Graham. I mean, okay. Let me finish this up, and we're gonna we're gonna get and move into up in the rotation. Xander Kraus here. He said some of the missed tackles were misfits in the run defense. He said Jalen Carter got double teamed. He can't lose his poise. His comments on Reed Blankenship, smart player, calm player, instinctive player. You know what that usually means? Not a lot of athleticism. And all the things that keep him on the field are all those intangibles. That's why Cooper DeGene is going to take his job one day. Okay? So, I thought it was an indictment. Think about that for a minute here. Boy, you do not want Vic Fangio talking about Bryce Huff. You just do not, because I've never heard him say one positive thing about it when it comes to his play. It's all conjecture. I've never heard him say a positive thing about him. I love how honest Vic is, man. I love him. Me too. Me too. Joseph, me too. All right, we're going to bring up Xander Krause. Early in the rotation here. And don't forget, too, Mark Holmes, your big opponent could be the Dallas Cowboys. Am I sold yet? I think the New Orleans game is going to tell me a little bit more about 
uh, the Cowboys. I want to see him do it again. It was a great performance against the Cleveland Browns. No Philly 500. He can't come aboard. And we will have Mike Gullick with us at 5.30 Eastern time. We'll get Mike's thoughts on week one of the National Football League. But let's bring up um, Xander Krause now. 365 does a great job with John and them dudes. How you doing, brother? Shells, what's going on, man? Thanks for slotting me in a little bit early today. What did you make of what I said about uh, some of the things about Jalen Hurts and the motion that and, – and, again, Xander, did you hear that clip I played? Yeah, replay it for me real quick. Okay. Um, if, you, if you have it handy. I do. And I thought it was interesting because this is kind of what I saw on the all, on the all 22 here. Okay. So this was on Get Up. And they broke down Jalen Hurts' play against the Packers, and they were talking about motion. And this is what I've been saying about it, but it was good to hear someone else break it down. Here we go. His precision. He was 0 for 5 on tight window throws, which means his target had fewer than a yard of separation from the defender. One of those was those three turnovers are tied for the most in a game in his career. So we gave Hawk a little assignment. Mm -hmm. We said, Hawk, I want you to study the tape. Yeah. 